good evening uh, to you all i am ankur choudhary right i'll be taking this session uh, this is a part of uh, six online uh, lectures that we have on gdpi content building right so what the aim of these sessions are to give you enough raw material or fodder for you to speak in a substantial manner or frame your arguments and substantiate them with certain facts when you are asked topics related to general knowledge in your gd or written ability tests or perhaps even questions in your personal interviews right so we'll be having six of these sessions some of you already know them or some of you might have attended such sessions so let me just briefly tell you about them six sessions there will be two sessions on economy the first one is basics of indian economy the second session related to economy is basics of banking sector in india and related issues next two set of lectures are related to social and political issues in india these are divided into two parts right next next set of two lectures are related to india and international affairs right these are also divided into two separate parts right uh, so if you have not attended india and the world one this is part 2 of that particular presentation right don't worry these two do not have any continuity in between them these are two independent and separate lectures okay uh, so before we start just a couple of instructions make sure you have your pen and paper ready at hand these are of course uh, general knowledge related sessions and uh, these are very content heavy and i'm supposed to cover a lot in a space of one and a half hours which is i believe absolutely not enough so do bear with me if i'm going very fast try to pay attention remove all your distractions remove your phone away from your sight right and also uh, the session will be going on till 8 o'clock i'll take questions uh, from you not during the lecture but i'll take a break at 6 at 7 uh, o'clock i'll take a 5 minute question around then then one at 7:30 and all the remaining questions i'll address at 8 o'clock right so these are the broad areas i seek to cover i hope to cover during the course of this presentation uh one more bit of instruction please ask me questions only related to this presentation or the slides that i'm able to that i'll uh, i'll be presenting in front of you all other questions related to gk you can ask in their related sessions right otherwise it won't make sense asking them today first of all we'll just take a look at the broad contours of india india and us relations right so our prime minister visited uh, usa in last year of september right there were a major agreement signed between the two countries as far as climate is concerned energy export control and defense cooperation cyber security counter terrorism as well as trade so just broadly let me broadly just give you certain highlights of these agreements first one is related to climate now india had a problem in including hfcs that is hydrofluorocarbons within the scope of what is called montreal protocol which was signed in 1985 so montreal protocol as much some of you must be knowing is an international agreement amongst various countries to cut down the use of chlorofluorocarbons right this agreement was quite successful uh, and uh, right now we see ozone ozone uh, layer or ozone hole which was which had built up in uh, southern over southern pole and the north pole it's con uh, continues to fill itself up because of almost uh, 100% compliance of banning of chlorofluorocarbons india initially was not agreeing to include hfcs within the scope of montreal protocol that is it was not agreed to ban agreeing to ban uh, hfcs but now india is agreed with usa to include this as far as energy is concerned we see a considerable movement towards the finalizing or the operationalization of indo us nuclear deal which was signed in 2008 so ever since 2008 there have not been there has not been any uh, major agreements as far as uh, nuclear deals have been concerned right however now 
Westinghouse, there is a company of USA, Westinghouse. It has agreed to supply six nuclear reactors to India. So that is a huge uh, achievement as far as Indo-US relations are concerned. Next, we talk about export control and defense cooperation. So India has been given a new status by the USA as its strategic partner. Right? So India has been given the status of a strategic partner as far as defense cooperation is concerned. This is a huge achievement again because only six other nations enjoy that kind of a relationship with USA. It would include defense exports, technology transfer as well as an important agreement which is known as uh, LEMOA. Right? As far as this agreement is concerned, it allows USA military uh, equipment and military men to come and use the infrastructure and the land as far as uh, Indian Army is concerned. Right? However, these are not uh, your military bases or defense based bases like India, uh, USA has across the world. USA can only use these facilities from India in case of humanitarian disasters or uh, humanitarian disasters or natural disasters only. Right? So there was a lot of controversy in this regard that India is giving up its sovereignty. However, that is not truly the case. The government clarified as this, these are not military bases and can only be used in case of disasters. Next, there are certain important uh, agreements which were signed as far as cyber security is concerned. India and US continue to be uh, one of the favorite targets of uh, hackers and cyber threats. So they have agreed to share intelligence related to cyber attacks in other countries. Next important one is counter-terrorism. Now there is an international treaty that India proposed uh, in the UN called CCIT, Comprehensive Convention on International Terrorism. Right? This was proposed by India in 1996, Comprehensive Convention on International Terrorism. Now according to this particular treaty, if it is signed, then it seeks to put sanctions on countries which allow their land to be used by terrorists to execute attacks on other nations. Right? So India has this particular complaint against Pakistan since uh, mid of 1980s. So India pushed, uh, proposed this in 1996 but did not find many supporters for this particular cause. Right? So as far as CCIT is concerned, now India has reiterated its demand after the Pathan Court and Uri attacks and USA has agreed to support India's uh, position in the United Nations. Again, some important trade related uh, agreements were also signed between the two governments as well as uh, certain business, certain businessmen and entrepreneurs as well. India and US have also agreed to uh, push up the uh, trade between India and US up to 500 billion dollars from the current 100 billion dollars in the next five years. Right? These are certain things that I've already spoken about. Logistics Exchange Memorandum of Agreement, LEMOA, Anti-Terror Mechanism, right, to share basically the intelligence between uh, related terror attacks in India, between India and USA and trade and economic relations. That is something we've already spoken about. Next, uh, we talk about the relations between India and Russia. Russia is considered to be India's all time, all weather friend, right? Because this is because India and Russia have enjoyed a very, very close relationship ever since the time of our independence. We have depended heavily on Russia to supply us with uh, a modern and uh, complex uh, defense equipments as well as space technologies. The relationship is so deep that we have a regular mechanism of annual summit meetings between our defense ministers foreign ministers as well as our heads of state right and the recent visit of uh, our prime minister to russia we agreed to manufacture russian kamov 226 helicopters in india one distinct feature of india or indo russia relationship is russia always is keen on transferring its defense technologies to india in case of and always promotes joint development of defense equipments. So one major example is that of BrahMos missile. This was a Russian missile which Russia has agreed to produce in India and teach Indian uh, engineers and scientists how to produce them. 
right this is a very successful example and then another uh, project that we've taken up together is fgfa that is fifth generation fighter aircrafts that we are developing with russia again similar to this an accord for cooperation in the field of helicopter engineering making russian designed nuclear reactors in india now russia has been supplying nuclear reactors to india since a very very long time and the prime example is that of kudankulam which is in tamil nadu right so three reactors that are they are uh, that are uh, very well functional have they have been constructed by using russia's help right then another cooperation in ca in case of uh, railway sector solar energy plants and exploration and production of oil in russia so when you talk about oil this is very important aspect of india's foreign policy india is a energy uh, deficient or any energy hungry country it imports almost 80% of its oil requirements right so 80% of its total requirements in per one particular year out of that 80% about let's say 15 to 20 years ago 80% of the total imports were from the middle east countries now those countries i uh, i'm sure you all must all all know that the trade route over there although these particular countries are quite volatile and have witnessed a number of conflicts over the past two or three decades so india is always keen on uh, diversifying is the sources of its oil imports so india is investing heavily in russia which is quite uh, rich in natural uh, in uh, oil uh, petroleum reserves and gas reserves right so we have uh, invested through a company called ONGC Videsh Limited right so uh, the company called ONGC it has a foreign arm called ONGC Videsh Limited called OVN so a uh, number of uh, fields that ONGC Videsh Limited has bought in russia next is a very important achievement as far as a foreign uh, policy is concerned we have been admitted into a agreement called international agreement called mtcr that is missile technology and control regime this is very important because it now allows us to import space and missile technologies also allows us to import russian cryogenic engine right and it will enable india to buy high end missile technology enhances joint ventures and very importantly it can export and hope to earn revenue by selling its brahmos cruise missile right and also certain predator drones uh samrudha i'll take your questions at 7 o'clock keep noting your questions down i'll address all of them don't worry as far as our relations with european union is concerned now an important meeting took place that is the 13th india eu summit a number of agreements were signed however this issue now becomes less important in the context of brexit right so we we'll talk more about indo uk relations and brexit as compared to indo eu relations let's talk about india uk relations a prime minister also visited uh, united kingdom and large number of agreements were signed during that visit again uh, uk expressed its support on india's proposal of ccit as we discussed earlier uh, ravi uh, you're on the internet go to google open a map you will be very clear right next uk reiterated its support for india's entry into the nsg that is the nuclear supply group a number of agreements as far as uh, trade and investments were signed between india and uk now next major event in the world uh, international arena came the issue of brexit so there was a referendum held in uk whether uh, britain wants to stay back in uh, as a part of european union or uh, move out of it the people voted for moving out and hence that issue is called brexit so there were uh, the the people who wanted to remain in britain and wanted to move out of britain were divided amongst each other on the basis of certain issues first first and most important one was that of immigration because britain was part of eu britain had to follow policies as dictated by the european union parliament now britain also was economically one of the more or rather the most post prosperous nation in eu so every other country within the eu every uh, a lot of them were sending or people from other countries other poorer countries would were coming into britain uh, 
uh, for economic prosperity so obviously the local british people had a problem with that another problem related to immigrants a large influx of immigrants due to britain part being part of uh, eu was that of jobs so uh, people in britain had a problem that the immigrants are taking away their jobs because they are ready to or willing to pay, uh, work for much much cheaper wages next was the issue of security now in this sense uh, there is a large xenophobic wave which is flowing across the world right so again brexit is a manifestation of xenophobia xenophobia is nothing but the fear of an outsider outsider or somebody who is different from us right a similar wave is gripping usa as you very well know donald trump uh, who took up the oath of as the 45th president of usa rode on this uh, anti immigrant agenda throughout his campaign right so there is an issue of security that the people of uk felt because due to syrian refugee crisis large number of people were moving into europe and britain and that is why people feared that there would be uh, terrorist attacks due to those immigrants then next issue is that of economy again as i said earlier britain was was the most pr- prosperous economy of european union but still it felt that it is its potential is being inhibited due to the rules imposed on britain due to european union so british uh, politicians they felt if we are independent from uh, european union the economy will be able to uh, move much faster and grow much faster much faster as compared to if they stay with eu so these were certain broad issues on which the brexit vote was divided Akhilesh, I'll take up that topic at uh, 7 p.m. Please do remind me to uh, speak a bit upon this. Okay. Next, we talk about Indo-Japan relations. These are not very important as far as your GDP right now are concerned, but the, as in, uh, there cannot be a specific uh, GD topic on Indo-Japan relations. But if there is a topic on India's foreign policy and its uh, implications, etc., then you have to mention how the, our relations with Japan are going on. right uh, the prime minister of japan visited india in 2015 one very important agreement which was signed was the nuclear agreement now even though india signed a nuclear agreement with usa in 2008 still us based companies were not able to sell uh, nuclear plants to india because of one major factor that is japan japan is not very happy with india because it is not a signatory to npt that is nuclear non proliferation treaty and ctbt i suggest you just uh, very quickly google them after this class of course uh, what these are all about so these were certain treaties that japan uh, india has not signed right now since india has not signed the uh, these treaties japan is not willing to sell critical components which it which it which it manufactures for us based companies which are selling nuclear power plants so what that uh, meant was even though us companies like westinghouse were willing to sell nuclear technology to india but because they use Jap- Jap- japanese technologies and components they were not able to sell them because japan was not willing to have a nuclear deal with india however right now the J- japan has softened its stance and it has signed nuclear agreement so as a result because of this agreement between india and japan we have seen now westinghouse exporting six nuclear reactors in india similarly defense and security relationship a number of uh, trilateral uh, there are there is a trilateral exercise military exercise between india us and japan so that is very important as far as our defense relations are concerned india has also bought uh, three amphibious uh, planes from or military related planes from japan similarly one major issue that remains is that trade volumes between india and japan are very very low however japanese investments in india are pretty high another important aspect of india and japan india's relationship with japan is that of oda that is overseas developmental assistance now this is uh, a grants or soft loans given by japan to india for various developmental projects for example delhi metro dmic right east dedicated 
dedicated freight corridors, etc. So, and also you must have heard about bullet trains. The bullet train that is coming up between Mumbai and Ahmedabad. So, Japan uh, gives us money also to build these things. These are in form of uh, interest-free loans or have loans which uh, interest which are very low, right? And also provides technical expertise to us. Now, of course, uh, uh, Japan is so uh, getting trying to get close to India. India is trying to get uh, so close to Japan is mainly to control China's rising China's influence in the region. Next, we talk about uh, international terrorism. So, first organization. Okay, so before we move forward, uh, let's let me take up your questions, please, and remove this disturbing photograph from your screens. Okay, Samrudha cryogenic uh, is a field of study uh, which is related to studying the uh, uh, behavior of uh, different uh, compounds and elements at very very low temperatures, right? So in a cryogenic engine, a liquefied hydrogen and oxygen are used as fuel and oxidizers. But, and they are kept at temperatures as low as minus 150 degrees Celsius to minus 180 degrees Celsius. The major advantage of a cryogenic engine is that it provides greater thrust. Sherlock, a very good question. Effect of Brexit on Indian economy. Now, exports of India to European Union are expected to fall due to the Brexit and the uncertainty created by it. As far as Brexit is concerned, Brexit has resulted, resulted in a slowdown in the British economy, which was a huge uh, exporter, uh, importer of Indian goods. So, because there is a slowdown over there, the export uh, revenue coming from Britain, that also reduces. Next is that of large number of Britain, British companies were investing in India in form of FDIs and FIIs. Again, that uh, amount of money coming every year, that is expected to come down. Another problem that we are facing now is that we were in the midst of uh, signing an agreement with EU as far as bilateral trade is concerned. Now, that, that particular agreement was almost in its final stages. However, now due to the exit of, uh, exit of Britain from EU, we will have to negotiate and sign a separate agreement with Britain. That agreement will happen, but it has now, for now, caused certain delays. Another issue is that of Indian companies which have operations in Britain. Now they will have to construct or make a separate office for Britain and a separate one for EU earlier, uh, making do with uh, only EU office. Akhlesh, uh, Britain of course being the sixth, uh, uh, earlier it was the sixth largest economy in the world, now is the seventh, India has recently overtaken it. So slowdown, an economic slowdown in Britain will lead to a global economic slowdown as well. London is the financial capital of Europe. Of course, if there is a slowdown in London, then of course the financial markets across the world are affected. So when the Brexit was announced, so you saw the Indian stock markets crashing and similar was the case in US and other countries as well. Piyush, I have asked you to uh, Google NPT that is not uh, very important as far as your GDPIs are concerned this particular year. Nikita, I am not sure I understand your question, soft Brexit. Uh, Mr. Positive, okay, OVL is ONGC Videsh Limited, ONGC is Oil and Natural Gas Corporation of India. Uh, all the investments that the government of India does across uh, other countries, uh, across our borders, it invests the through OVL, right? So it is the foreign arm of ONGC Videsh, ONGC Limited. Uh, Sherlock, India's uh, not just the economic growth has overtaken uh, that of UK, right? But the size of our India's economy is now bigger than that of UK. Akhlesh, uh, now uh, since you've asked this question, now uh, since you all know that. Uh, uh, Japan is the only country which has been attacked uh, using nuclear weapons across the world, right? So naturally, J Japanese politicians and Japanese people are very sentimental as far as nuclear weapons are concerned, nuclear energy are, is concerned. NPT as a treaty is in, uh, concerned with a non-transfer of nuclear technology between different countries. CTBT is Comprehensive Test Ban Treaty. It bans the uh, nuclear tests in any form, either underwater, under 
uh, underground or over the land in any form right so it bans these things so since india has not signed this so japanese mentality or sentiment senti sentiments did not allow it to uh, in to, to sign a nuclear agreement with india however now uh, that particular stance is so slowly softening right first due to rising assertiveness of china china is having conflicts with japan and china is having conflicts with uh, india as well so in international relations always remember one thing your enemy is enemy is your friend so that is why japan and india are continuously building stronger and closer relationships uh secondly of course uh, i spoke about sentimentality but uh, as far as sentiments are concerned economics always wins over emotions so when japan exports its technologies to india japan is hoping to earn a lot of export revenue so that is the reason why japan is uh, helping india in this sense yes mas i have i think i have explained it quite uh, elaborately guys uh, any more question before we move on now the next is a very uh, important issue as far as your uh, gd uh, vats and pis are concerned you have to understand first the basic ideology what is really wants right is and its name has evolved across uh, uh, the years earlier it was isil that is islamic state of israel uh, uh, iraq and levant right levant levant is a region that is uh, the region uh, between iraq and syria next it came to be called as isis islamic state of iraq and syria and next now it is known as islamic state or is simply it is a islamic fundamentalist wahhabi doctrine of sunni islam now as far as islam is concerned there is a division there is a there are two major sects that is shia and sunni right shia and sunni the division between them is not a part of this presentation i suggest you read the wikipedia uh, page of shia sunni conflict you'll be very clear on what the issue is all about right so it is an extremist faith wahhabism that is followed by uh, isis intention is the sort to establish itself as a caliphate or an islamic state right it wants to uh, uh, force uh, across the world across its territory its extremist doctrine of and it is a uh, quite uh, fundamentalists right and want to establish a caliphate that is nothing but an islamic state across the world next what are the different kind of strategies and tactics that they've uh, employed up, up over the years right now this is a very important topic uh, for your gd that is uh, social media and terrorism right so we've seen how isis and other terrorist organization like al qaeda uses social media and electronic media for to their gains so they would use propaganda first next they would provoke people next they would pass on instructions to its uh, various uh, followers on how to make bombs how to conduct attacks it will inspire people or or or, or uh, spread fake uh, news regarding atrocities on Islam, uh, muslims across the world most of them are lies anyways they seek to sensationalize by posting uh, beheading videos or other gruesome acts of theirs and so on and so forth right so this is a very important way that they are doing it's so a military recruitment uh, okay they are also using the uh, social media to get funding from similarly from people who are the similarly uh, who have a similar ideology right and also isis as an organization it uh, conquered conquered a large number of areas within iraq uh, with which were very rich in oil fields right so they were selling oil in the black market and getting their revenues right again from propaganda finance and resources this is how their strategy is going on next against isis a large number of countries have started uh, attacking them of course first one is usa russia france iraq these are certain countries major organizations that are involved in the conflict is are eu and nato now isis as such has its presence in across 140 countries over the world but it is right now most active in the middle eastern countries of syria iraq and 
other nations now these are certain attacks which if you are able to recall and quote them in the uh, gds or in your written ability test you'll get definitely get more marks uh, uh, one more suggestion uh, for such factual information just take a screenshot of this particular screen and uh, you'll have uh, ready made notes for yourself right these are certain organizations uh, which are more extremist than uh, even al qaeda and taliban taliban al bi and al qaeda we'll speak about a little later right again this is a reflection of a shia, shia, shia sunni uh, conflict syria and iraq is ruled by shias but isis supports sunni forces okay i'll just uh, i'm just bringing up the previous screen uh, for you to quickly take a screenshot the instruction remains the same for subsequent slides anything you want uh, to capture for later reading just take a screenshot right these are certain strategies that they uh, adopting forced conversion mass execution beheadings of shia muslims and non muslims in these regions want to form an is islamic caliphate across vast areas in asia africa and europe right and abu bakr al baghdadi this guy is the chief of isis is next we speak a little bit about uh, al qaeda now when you talk about the origin of uh, islamic state it is a faction of al qaeda al qaeda had a branch in iraq called al qaeda in iraq right abu uh, bakr al baghdadi was its uh, chief over there and he split away from its parent organization that is al qaeda and formed a new organization that is is when you talk about shia sunni conflict this is not really very important so i'll just quickly go through it historical struggle between shia and sunni forces so middle east is also divided into countries for example sunnis uh, uh, are dominant in saudi arabia and shias are dominated in iran and iraq right it has caused division in middle east across the countries that i have just spoken about international politics politics over religion this particular region is always under uh, is quite volatile because of interference of international powers they keep on supporting other side and this is a manifestation of a cold war which is going on between uh, russia and usa right then we have threat of a regional war and rise of isis as a consequence of a shia sunni conflict right so propaganda as far as propaganda of uh, these terrorist organizations are concerned they take it's not just limited to middle eastern uh, countries they spread lies or half truths about the atrocities so called atrocities being uh, in uh, done on muslim populations across kashmir chechnya which is, which is in uh, russia Xinjiang province of uh, China Palestine etc also another uh, strategy that they uh, adopt is misinterpretation of quranic verses and the impact of social media we've already kind of discussed during the presentation next we talk about al qaeda so uh, sharia law is a interpretation of the quran which is very fundamentalist in nature right so this is what how uh, al qaeda this is what uh, al qaeda believes in right believed afghanistan under the taliban was the only islamic country and all other countries are labeled as infidels or impure believed in violent jihad to right the justices against muslims and to eliminate the state of israel now israel due to its location uh, due to its historical uh, processes is a country which is which is inhabited by people who are jews right so jews from across the world after world war 2 given this were were given this particular land which was carved out of a already existing country called palestine right so these uh, countries the victors of world war 2 usa france uh, and mainly britain right they carved out this piece of land from palestine and said that yes all the jews across the world can go ahead and live over there if they want to so the origin of this conflict starts from after the world war 2 however uh, israel is very uh, typically the, its location is quite uh, precarious because it is surrounded by uh, arabic countries and they feel that jews are uh, and the israel israelites are the enemies of the arabs right so that's why you have a lot of conflict as far as israel and middle east conflict is concerned next we have uh, another terrorist organization which became defunct after the us led invasion on 
of, of Afghanistan after the WTC attack in 2001, right? So Taliban is the organization which took control over Afghanistan in 1996. They follow strict Islamic laws which include misinterpretation of Quranic verses. It ruled till 2001, US led inv in invasion and it controlled southern Afghanistan. Right now, well earlier it was defeated uh, by US led coalition. But this coalition has, sort, is, has uh, kind of moved out of USA. But right now, uh, we see a rise of Taliban-led forces in the Afghanistan, which is threatening the stability of the region. Next, we take an important topic of climate change. First uh, important issue is that of Kyoto Protocol. This was an international agreement which came into force in 2005. The basic principle behind it was CBDR, that is, common but differentiated responsibilities. So uh, all the countries who signed the Kyoto Protocol, they agreed that global warming is a problem and solving that problem is a common responsibility. However, the key factor here was they realized that not all the countries are equally responsible for global warming. And in this sense, the developed countries like USA and Western European countries like UK, France, Germany, Italy, etc. It was said that these countries are more responsible for pollution because they experienced uh, the industrial revolution and have and are huge industrial powers ever since 18th century. However, the developing countries like India, Brazil, China, Egypt, South Africa, etc. They are now developing countries and it is time for them to industrialize, right? So, while everyone agreed to stop global warming, however, a greater amount of restrictions were kept, were uh, imposed on these developed countries. That is what you understand by CBDR principle, right? So, developed nations only were, the there was a cap that was kept on greenhouse gas emissions and this cap was applicable only on the developed nations according to CBDR principle. This was the agreement. They agreed to reduce overall emissions by 5.2% of the 1990 levels by the end of 2012. So developed countries, they were restricted, but developed nation, uh, developing nations, they were exempted. That is, there was no limit on their exemptions uh, on this. Also, they introduced the concept of carbon trading in Kyoto Protocol. Let's understand what is carbon trading. Carbon trading is an administrative approach used to control pollution by providing economic incentives for achieving reductions in the emissions of pollutants. Right? So it was an uh, administrative tool. Let's just uh, take an illustration for your better understanding. So for example, a developed nation like Australia, according to Kyoto Protocol, their uh, emission limits were limited to let us say 100 uh, tons of uh, carbon dioxide in a particular year for example right however australia ends up producing 120 tons right but there is a developing country that is india let us say india's limit was uh, 100 also but india ended up uh, emitting only 80 in uh, in actuality, right? So, Australia exceeded its mark uh, by 20 units and India has kind of 20 units still left. So, Australia would pay India, Australia would pay India to develop certain green technologies, right? Or less polluting technologies and would purchase these credit units from it and balance out its uh, excesses, right? So, that is basically what carbon trading was all about. So I hope uh, this particular uh, carbon trading issue is clear. So the major issues that were related to Kyoto Protocol and why it was not a huge success. Let's just talk about them. Right. So developed countries were not very happy with the principle of CBDR because uh, Kyoto Protocol did not restrict the emission levels of major pollutants like India and China. Right? Developed countries wanted equal emission levels for developing nations, major nations like India and China. Right? But the developing nations kept uh, blaming the developed countries for uh, causing such a lot of uh, pollution and global warming related problems. The, 
end result was USA, which which was the largest producer uh, producer of uh, greenhouse gases in the world, did not agree to sign the or ratify the Kyoto Protocol. That is, it did not become a part of Kyoto Protocol, right? But it individually said that uh, it will cut greenhouse gas emissions by seven percent below 1990 levels. However, USA emission rose by seven sixteen percent between 1990 and 2005. Next, the issue came of Kyoto Protocol. It expired in 2012 because of deadlock. Kyoto Protocol has been extended till 2020 because there is no agreement between developed and developing world on to the 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 amount of uh, cuts or, or emission that should be kept. So due to this deadlock, Kyoto Protocol was extended in 2020 in 2013, right? now we have come across with a new kind of a system that was related to a conference held in lima lima is of course in portugal let's just see what lima conference was all about lima conference uh, it decided a road map for the paris conference in 2015 right the major issues that were uh, spoken about or discussed were developed world wanted cbdr principle to be replaced they said that if countries like india and china they are major polluters they should not be exempted from greenhouse gas emission uh, cuts but the developing world including india they wanted to retain it right the final draft contains cbdr right and uh, respective capacities and capabilities of countries and finally national circumstances right so this is where uh, a dilution of kyoto protocol starts happening and gets uh, in the form of paris cop 21 so 2015 we had a conference of parties cop stands for conference of parties this is the 21st meeting of an organization called unfccc that is united nation framework convention on climate change right long term goal it is it was uh, accepted again that global warming should stay between a uh, stay below uh, a 2 degree celsius rise in the global average temperature since industrial revolution in europe right emission targets again over here again a dilution of uh, kyoto protocol is seen indc is intended nationally determined contributions right indc i am repeating intended nationally determined contributions right so what this said it uh, while kyoto protocol imposed uh, quantifiable limits on emissions but indc principle it says that every country is free to decide on how much cuts it will make right that is the first difference second difference is the for the countries who flouted kyoto protocol norms they were punished or uh, censured right they had they were liable to be punished if they flouted kyoto protocol norms however in case uh, of indc targets if the country flouts or uh, does not adhere to the limits that it sets for itself there is absolutely no punishment involved so again this particular agreement seems to be quite infructuous right then there are certain uh, uh, provisions like reviewing the targets in the next 4 years to see if the, they can update them right this was pretty much an i wash next trans, no penalty for countries as i said earlier that miss their emission targets transparency rules to help encourage countries to actually do what they say they will do two important aspects that came out of it were related to financial support to help poor countries and also the recognition to loss and damage associated with climate related disasters so it was the first time that the developed world have formally agreed that poorer countries are more uh, vulnerable to disasters related to climate change so for example if there is a drought in uh, usa the damage will not be so high as compared to if there is a drought in a poor country like sudan so due to that uh, due to the uh, greater uh, damage that climate change causes in poorer countries the uh, developed countries have agreed to 
provide financial support right india and climate change these are certain things that you will do well if you are uh, uh, if you read uh, through them first one is national action plan on climate change it has seven separate schemes working under it one of them most important ones is national solar mission right earlier the target was that of 20000 megawatt to be uh, of uh, solar energy to be produced by 2022 now the target has been revised upwards may uh, done five times in fact to 1 lakh megawatt by 2022 right and there are six similar other schemes uh, just google it out quickly go through it if you are able to recall these names during the course of your uh, uh, gds or if you are able to quote them in your vat then good on your part next uh, we see we saw uh, the uh, ngt or national green tribunal banning diesel vehicles in delhi right uh, over 2000 2000 ccs although that was a very impractical decision but this is what has been happening india getting serious more serious on climate change slowly also the delhi experiment of even or odd even formula which was done before. this is another uh, important agreement related to climate change that is kigali deal on hydrofluorocarbon hydrofluorocarbons this is something that i spoke about earlier uh, when we were talking about indo us relations so october 2016 in rwanda its capital kigali an agreement was signed when 70 countries amended the montreal protocol on uh, uh, the control of uh, chlorofluorocarbons to eliminate hydrofluorocarbons also right so hydrofluorocarbons were also included and take 0.5 degree celsius out of future global warming so it is felt that if hydrofluorocarbons are also banned so the uh, rise in global average temperature can be limited or reduced to 0.5 degree celsius right rich countries including the us japan and europe will start phasing out synthetic hfcs in 2019 china in 2024 and india and less ambitious countries in 2028 right guys i'll take your questions now piyush uh, yes taliban is quite active in pakistan as well a number of attacks have uh, been executed by taliban in pakistan now this is a very uh, interesting and very dangerous situation which is coming up which is building up in this particular region now I, is islamic state al qaeda and taliban they are fighting for resources amongst themselves they are competing with each other for resources financial resources right next uh, recruitment uh, or personnel so all of them are executing more and more spectacular attacks to extend their reach beyond their regions right so that is why the situation is situation is quite grim there are large number of attacks even in france uh, we've seen three or four attacks in the recent uh, in the past three or four years right each one trying to better the other diksha these rates are uh, in fact uh, decided uh, by the unfcc itself and the trading countries amongst themselves yes yogesh uh, kigali deal definitely has it has a legal binding chinni uh, i fail to recall any uh, particular schemes launched by the prime minister although uh, he does launch some a lot of schemes but uh, nothing related to climate change specifically that i can recall right now but definitely this uh, uh, upgrading of uh, the target of national solar mission was done by the current prime minister yes sherlock definitely taliban is rising again earlier the uh, nato and uh, us based forces were keeping a check on them now they have left or partially left afghanistan the uh, afghanistan military and police are not able to control them and they are subsequently talibani forces are regrouping and restrengthening in afghanistan as pakistan as well however uh, it's a very interesting question that you ask and a question that uh, almost everyone has uh, on their mind uh, but you have to realize that uh, people or politicians say a lot of things uh, before elections and they end up doing some things very different after the election so let's just wait and watch what uh, mr trump uh, actually does on uh, climate change yogesh if uh, if a, if if a country breaks an international treaty or exceeds exceeds the limit it is liable to be sanctioned by the un in terms of un uh, economic sanction and trades etc trade etc uh, priyanka no jews are very different parsis are very different parsis are 
uh, follow a religion called Zoroastrianism, right? Jews follow a religion called Judaism, right? For more, you must Google, right? Uh, it's not possible for me to uh, go into detail. Aman, yes, that uh, includes uh, other renewable energy uh, sources as well, right? Like hydropower, uh, tidal power, geothermal power, etc., etc. So what I had spoken about was only solar power. Wind also, yes, wind as well. Uh, Sherlock, no, it's not an, uh, it's not. I would call it an amendment, but it's a continuation or a successor agreement of Kyoto Protocol. Any more questions before we uh, proceed? Sherlock, yes, uh, uh, Kyoto Protocol has failed, although the data of uh, world over has not really been released till now. But uh, yes, it was not a huge success because USA, the biggest polluter in the world, was not a part of it, right? And uh, countries like India and uh, China as well, they cannot continue to, you know, put the blame on uh, developed countries and keep polluting the way they are because eventually we have just one planet to live on. Aman, I'll be covering uh, MDGs and SDGs in subsequent slides. So just uh, be patient for a moment. Okay, any more questions? Okay, moving on. European refugee crisis, right? Again, these are more factual in nature, nothing ready to explain. So just keep taking notes or taking screenshots of the subsequent slides. Since 2007, migrants from Middle East and Africa have crossed uh, between Turkey and Greece, right? Conf uh, since 2007, this has been happening. 2013, this was a major accident which happened, a shipwreck of uh, migrants trying to get into Italy and the ship was sank uh, and with it uh, 300 or people died in the Italian island close to the Italian island of Lampedusa. Right? Italian government then set up Operation Mare Nostrum to uh, control the influx of immigrants in this country. Right? Operations ended in 2014 and superseded by Frontex Operation Triton. Again, 2015, five ships uh, in April 2015, five ships cap capsized and sank, and death toll was close to 1,200 people. Right now, the wave of immigrants has been coming into uh, Europe since 2007, as we saw. A number of countries are under conflict in Middle East. First and foremost, Pakistan, Afghanistan, and Iraq, right, and Syria today, right. Triggers of the 2015 crisis. This crisis has become very acute in, in 2015, right? Sudden and massive increase in migrant numbers in the summer of 2015. This is because Syrian government under Bashar al-Assad announced the increased military conscription. That is, a number of people uh, uh, against their will were included or made a part of the military, right? Also, there is another, another issue of number of uh, attacks that were conducted by the uh, Bashar al-Assad government against his own uh, population. That is why trying to escape that conflict, the Syrian crisis, uh, the uh, refugee crisis has increased. Of course, uh, the debate between refugees and the uh, existing people of the, uh, of the particular region that they are going into that we've already discussed in case of Brexit. There are security concerns, there are economic concerns, etc., etc. So another very important point as far as GDs are concerned is that you have to open your mind, keep your mind open and use knowledge from other topics to substantiate on the topic which you are given. Next, we talk about United Nations and it's how and why United Nations in its current form needs certain reforms. First, let's have some uh, factual information about this. Founded in 1945 after World War II to replace League of Nations. League of Nations was obviously was of course found in 1919 after the end of World War I. Its main objective was to avoid or prevent World War II, which it failed, uh, and it was replaced by United Nations. United UN Charter was signed by 51 member countries on 26 June 19. 45. Officially, it came into existence in 24th October 1945. This is the broad structure of United Nations. Uh, we have a new Secretary General, of course. This is not Ban Ki-moon. He has been replaced by 
uh, a former uh, portuguese prime minister called antonio yes antonio guterres double t r e e s right pardon my uh, poor handwriting g u double t e r e s right so let's just broadly talk about the uh, how the un functions right this is the general assembly all the members enjoy have one vote in the general assembly all its decisions are taken uh, on the basis of majority however it is only a recommendatory body it is a recommending body as you can see here and all the decisions are in fact taken by a much smaller body called security council it consists of p5 nations and 10 non permanent members the key here is these p5 nations which includes china russia france usa and britain right these p5 nations enjoy veto power right for any decision of the un to come into force all the five have to agree right so that is a major flaw of united nations so there are a lot of problems with united nations it was formed in 1945 and the p5 nations are still those nations which were powerful in 1995 uh, 1945 when it was formed however since that period almost 70 years ago a number of other powerful nations are also seen across the world for example japan germany india and brazil south africa egypt etc right so the uh, united nations security council does not reflect the current realities of the world so there has been a lot of demand from these countries uh, uh, that uh, like japan india germany uh, south africa etc to reform the un security council and include these nations as well right so and in this uh, case a very important development took place in the last uh, few months the united general uh, un general assembly unanimously adopted a negotiating text for the security council reforms right so a major achievement was there that they have formally agreed that yes we should discuss reforming the un un security council right this is the first time in the history of intergovernmental negotiations process that a decision on unsc reform has been adopted by means of an official document so till now only there were only talks but now an official document has been accepted so let's see where that takes us right what are the various needs of un un security council reforms as i said earlier it is a still a reflection of post world war 2 era and does not reflect the multilateral world as it exists today right next in the past quarter century the global order has seen massive changes from american unilateralism right to the rise of multilateral institutions like brics so after in 1991 up till 1991 from uh, the world war 2 there were two superpowers in the world that is usa and ussr next after the disintegration of ussr in 1991 there was a rise of un unilateralism that is un was a uh, usa was the only uh, nation which was which was the super power in the world however today we see the rise of nations that is the brics nations which are quite powerful as com- even in comparison to usa right so the un security council is not reflecting this reality then the developing nations including india now play a bigger role in international affairs but within the un the five permanent veto wielding members still effectively take all the crucial decisions so that is why there is a need for uns unsc reforms and people are quite dissatisfied with the way un is functioning the indian position is that democracy deficit in the un prevents effective multilateralism in the global arena so when there are uh, power is not no longer concentrated in one country that is usa but only voice that is heard is that of only these p5 nations and not other countries like india and brazil also there is an issue of geopolitical rivalry amongst the p5 nations now since uh, every nation has a veto power right so any decision let us say take taken by usa Uh, is countered by russia or by china and similar and vice versa right so un security council has become quite ineffective 
next uh, the way unsc has handled certain uh, uh, or failed to handle certain global events most recent example is that of bombing in aleppo right this is the second largest city in syria russian fighter jets have been bombing uh, these uh, areas for a very long time now uh, there has been considerable civilian uh, loss humanitarian losses but un security council uh, is not able to broker a peace deal or do something about the civilian casualties in that region right these are certain instances where un security council has failed the korean war of 1950s vietnamese war of 1960s and 70s cuban missile crisis in 1962 middle east crisis afghanistan iraq and so on and so forth next are more facts uh, major conflicts um, almost 150 uh, major conflicts since to world war 2 right right us invasion now us has acted unilaterally in a number of countries for example un security council rejected uh, attacks on uh, libya but U usa went ahead and did it anyway so that is also a question on the effectiveness of a un security council ussr's invasion of afghanistan this is in 1979 and so on and so forth so many people who have died during the cold war and refugees worldwide increased to 70 million people right despite un being there and un not being able to prevent such crisis right so if you are able to quote these figures in your ppts uh, in your uh, gdpis uh, it will be great then of course uh, how do you assess un's performance uh, throughout its uh, life span right as far as uh, human rights uh, promotions are concerned of course it has a charter of human rights but has it really be, uh, been able to promote uh, the cause of human rights across the world that remains a question preventing nuclear proliferation right since 1945 more and more number of countries have acquired nuclear weapons and un has not been able to stop uh, the spread of nuclear technology apartheid in south africa as you all know was the segregation between whites and blacks of south africa it ended as late as 1991 even after 46 years of existence of united nations providing humanitarian aid to victims of conflict so you must have seen uh, the uh, the disturbing pictures from aleppo and uh, earlier uh, the immigrants uh, the uh, illegal immigrants or refugees uh, to europe again un has again failed these people in distress to provide any kind of humanitarian relief curbing global warming again you seeing that uh, kyoto protocol which was uh, still a stronger agreement has been diluted in the paris uh, conference of cop21 as we discussed earlier improving global trade relations again over here the performance of united nations is still is is uh, questionable because countries still prefer signing bilateral uh, uh, trade agreements between each other as compared to signing few uh, regional agreements right preventing global epidemics it has been uh, there has been limited success in terms of uh, uh, eradication of smallpox and eradication of uh, polio in southeast uh, asian nations however still there is lot that remains to be done as far as uh, prevention of global epidemics is concerned next even after 72 years of its existence un uh, we still have uh, very very poor countries across the world which are not helped in any way by develop, developed countries or developing countries still so these are the this is the broad framework you can follow if you have a gd or a vat on the relevance of united nations in today's right uh, next uh, another frame that framework that you you might utilize for the purpose of uh, analysis of un's performance is that of millennium development goals these goals were agreed upon by united nations for the period between 2000 till 2015 right so these were eight goals each goal had a uh, specific quantified uh, measurable targets against itself right these goals um, millennium development goals they expired in the year 2015 right and were replaced by right these this is this is the same millennium development goals only and they were replaced by sustained what are called sustainable development goals 
they are a set of 17 goals again with measurable targets some of the parameters are same like maternal mortality rate infant mortality rate hunger hunger poverty etc etc right but these targets have now been raised as compared to millennium development goals right so as far as achievement of goals under millennium development goals are concerned again i suggest you go through uh, just google india's performance in millennium development goals so india lagged quite far behind as far as poverty targets hunger related targets uh, maternity uh, reducing maternity mortality rates infant mortality rates so india fell behind a large number of these targets and so did other developing nations so that also points to a, a kind of a limitation on the part of united nations various issues that are related to united nation reform is first one is g4 this is a group of countries consisting of india japan germany and brazil these are these countries are working together to reform the un security council some other major nations which are also working are these south africa egypt india japan brazil and as well as germany however there is a group of countries which who do not want to change the un security council right and that has come to be uh, famously uh, to be known as uh, coffee club so i'll just go to the previous slide on uh, diksha's request okay i hope you've got the screenshot so uh, when we spoke about united nations we spoke about international political cooperation next let's take a look at a few organizations related to international economic cooperation right so bretton woods twins uh, institutions that is a name given to imf that is international monetary fund and as well as world bank they were formed in the year 1945 after a conference which was held in bretton woods in the usa right and the next the third organization major organization that discusses the world trade organization right these are certain factual issues uh, related to imf and its functioning it op its operations involve uh surveillance of international financial system so that there is not a repeat of a 2007 uh, uh crisis which started in usa and spread across the world right financial assistance to countries in case of a balance of payment crisis that is when the forex reserve of a particular country falls to very low levels technical support uh, imf also provides in case a uh, country wants to change the structure of its economy so for example in 1991 we uh, saw lpg reforms in india liberalization privatization and globalization reforms right so since because since this was a very new for india we got technical support on how to go about it through the imf then of course uh, major function is economic research and statistics the way imf works is very different as compared to other organizations like un now in un general assembly every uh, country has one vote whether it's a large country like russia or a very small country like sri lanka however in imf as well as world bank which whichever company contributes the most has the most weight uh, attached to its vote right so imf co uh, members quota determines his voting weight so this is very important as far as IMF functioning is concerned right and these are the objectives of IMF right international monetary cooperation exchange stability economic growth provide temporary financial assistance and help ease balance of payment uh, crisis or adjustments right so uh, let's just uh, look at the recent controversies as these are most important as far as your uh, the second process of your selection is concerned right recent controversies developing countries like india china brazil south africa etc seek more rights in the functioning of imf now as i said earlier the more money uh, a country contributes in imf quota uh, the more weight is attached to its vote so as far as usa and its friends are concerned for example france germany japan etc they constitute approximately 40% of the total vote percentage in the us uh, in the uh, imf as well as world bank 
and also these countries always vote together so it's never a, a situation that comes that comes up that japan does not agree with what usa is voting with in imf and world bank so what that means is these countries dictate necessarily which countries to forward these forward imf and world bank loans to secondly uh, these countries extend loans to countries with and uh, attach certain conditions for example india borrowed from imf in 1991 right to ease over its uh, balance of payment crisis the condition that they put was that you have to necessarily reform your market and that is how lpg reforms were introduced next uh, these developing nations are questioning the logic of always choosing of a european for ims managing director post however uh, recently just to assuage these controversies uh, versus uh, i there were certain reforms that were introduced in imf so more than 6 percentage points of the quota including both the funds capital and its proportionate voting rights have been transferred from developed to emerging economies right so some vote percentage has been given to uh, developing economies let's see india's voting rights has increased from to 2.6% from 2.3% and as far as china is concerned from 6 to 3. 8% for the first time four emerging market uh, merging uh, countries brazil china india and russia will be among the 10 largest members of the imf in terms of their uh, uh, weight of their vote right the greatest gains from the reforms accrued to the imf itself as the combined capital of that its 188 members countries contribute will uh, increase to approximately 658 billion so this is the amount the extra money that these emerging economies will be contributing in the imf uh, funds uh, and that's how their quota is increasing right however you see the discrepancy here us voting share will marginally drop from 16.7 to only 16.5 16. right so there is only a minimal reduction in us Uh, share in the IMF. Next, we talk about World Bank. Uh, these are certain components of World Bank. Again, uh, I'm not going to the details of each of these components as these are not important for your GDs. These are more factual related topics. So these are, uh, if you do want to, you take a screenshot of these uh, this screen and just Google one of these uh, all of these uh, five agencies that the World Bo- World Bank Group has. All I I'll, uh, I'll talk about. uh only the controversies related to world bank and related issues however while i'll come to aiib yes i will definitely uh, i'm coming to that again uh, these are certain factual issues uh i request you to uh, take a screenshot uh, guys keep taking screenshots uh, these are quite self explanatory right i want you to i want to address your questions more the, those are more important as compared to uh, compare uh, covering these factual topics uh, so uh, i i hope you've all taken the uh, snapshot of the last four slides right let's just talk about two important organizations now broadly speaking imf gives short term loans in case of balance of payment crisis of countries and world bank gives long term loans to developing nations for development purposes infrastructure purpose for example uh, service shiksha abhiyan of india it has loans from world bank it has taken loan from a world bank now we were also understood that imf and world bank are not democratic institutions uh, there is an undue uh, bias uh, toward or rather uh, us and certain developed countries are more influential in these two organizations they select on uh, select the which country the loan should be given and they put conditions on these countries as well not due to the rise of brics the terms imposed by imf and world bank are not agreeable by these countries right so what brics has done now it has raised a kind of a competitor to uh, these two institutions that is called new development bank right also known as brics bank right ndb is new development bank now when you talk about ndb it performs two functions right all these five nations are equal contributors and they have one vote each so that is different from imf and world bank right 
NDP will provide short term loans in case of balance of payment crisis and also it will provide long term loans for developmental purposes. So you can very well see that BRICS bank will mirror the functions of IMF and World Bank. Right? So that is a competitor that the developing uh, nations have raised against the uh, IMF and World Bank. Another important uh, institution that has been recently formed is the AIIB, right? Uh, that is Asian Infrastructure and Investment Bank. So this is a bank which has been uh, initiated by China. It has more than 50 members now. It will extend long-term loans for infrastructure development, again mirroring the uh, functions of World Bank. So. So these two institutions can be seen as a rival to the uh, western uh, dominated uh, regimes of World Bank and IMF. Guys, uh, uh, that is the end of our presentation. I'll, uh, I'll be glad to take your questions, although I, I know the time is over. I'll just come to slide number 42. Chinni, I'm not sure uh, of the question that you're asking. Yogesh, uh, countries like uh, USA and again its partners, for example, France, Right and Britain, they are already who are P5 members and uh, and are quite close to together. They are the members of Coffee Club. Yes, broadly speaking, Konica, that is the uh, that is the definition of balance of payment crisis. The idea is you are importing. Uh, no, what you've written is wrong. Uh, you are importing more as compared to what you are exporting. So your uh, foreign foreign exchange reserves they are depleting. Uh, Priyanka, Asian Development Bank is also a bank which is similar in function to World Bank but it only uh, funds infrastructural projects, developmental projects like uh, Swachh Bharat Abhyan, uh, uh, Clean Ganga uh, campaign etc. But it finances only projects, these such kind of projects only in Asia. Otherwise the functioning remains the same. It provides uh, long term loans at lower interest rates. So Piyush, uh, India is uh, now arguing that India is a nuclear power, is a responsible nuclear power. It has, uh, it is the second most populous nation in the world. It is the seventh largest country in the world by area. It's the uh, sixth largest economy uh, in the world and uh, third largest economy as far as uh, GDP at PPP is concerned. Now, India has contributed one of the uh, max, uh, maximum number of people in UN peacekeeping force. Now all these credentials India is asserting and saying that now it deserves a place in the UN Security Council. Those are the arguments for India. Yogesh, that is a very very important and valid point that you raise. ADB and AIIB, these ADB is a very small institute as compared to World Bank, right? ADB's the capability is limited to approximately 10 billion dollars a year. So when you talk about IMF and World Bank, they are talking about 600 or 700 billion dollars a year. So ADB cannot replace World Bank and IMF. Similarly is the case of AIIB. The initial uh, share uh, paid up capital as far as AIIB is concerned was approximately 50 billion dollars and again nowhere in comparison to what the kind of money IMF and World Bank have. But again, that is the start of an organization which can potentially compete with other countries. Nirdesh, again, that is a very valid point. ADB is Japan dominated and Japan pretty much agrees with what USA says. So in the end, indirectly, USA is in control of IMF, World Bank as well as ADB. Yes, Yogesh, third largest army as well. Okay, any more questions? Yeah, thank you so much and uh, have a good night. Thank you.